Hello, everybody. Good evening. We are so excited to see you. Welcome to the Detroit Opera House, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrea Scobie. I am the Director of Education here at Detroit Opera. And I am Arthur White, Director of External Affairs. We are thrilled that you have joined us for yet another pre-opera talk, starting the whole season. You know, last year, of course, uh, we opened the house back doing performances after the pandemic, uh, back starting with La Boheme. But here we have a whole full season of pre-opera talks for the whole season, you know, for the whole uh, time, whether it's starting with uh, uh, the Valkyries or Faust and going on to uh, Baroque uh, with Xerxes next year. So we're just excited that you all are here. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about this piece. We have a wonderful guest tonight, um, the best person possible to give us a look at not only this piece, um, this small piece of the entire ring cycle, um, but of course this very unusual and exciting production that we're going to see tonight. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce and to welcome uh, Yuval Sharon, who is Detroit Opera's artistic director and also the director of this production of The Valkyries. Uh, let's welcome him Please now. Please welcome him. Mr. Yuval. All right. oh. How's everybody? Thank you for joining us. Yes. Glad to see you all. So Yuval, for anyone who's here tonight who might be new to the ring cycle, um, what how many? How many of those are there? Do we have folks who might be new to the ring? I mean, it's never been done in its full in its entirety here in Detroit, so I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, that's, yeah. that's right. Do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I wonder if you can give an introduction or a history to the piece. Yes, absolutely. The first thing you should know, and just so everyone gets a good uh, breath of relief, a sigh of relief, you don't need to have seen the ring cycle before to appreciate what we're going to do tonight. So um, just know that that is uh, absolutely okay if you have never seen the ring cycle before. We've designed this production so that it's only act three of Valkyrie, but it is, um, it's designed so you can take, the, take it in just as a, its own standalone opera. So um, we have a, a great introduction to the piece, which is part of the performance. Uh, and I don't want to spoil who gives it to you. Maybe if you saw on social media some of our video work, you know who it is. But anyway, we have a very starry video guest who will introduce you to the whole story. But the Ring Cycle is probably one of the most remarkable uh, operatic endeavors in, in history. It is a four opera cycle. It totals about 16 hours worth of opera, and it takes place over four nights. So you have to come back night after night. It's kind of like the, the, the first version of episodic TV. You know how usually like at home, you can just skip to the next episode right away? Well, when this opera premiered, you had to wait till the next day to see the next uh, installment of what would happen. Can't hear the audio? No, there's an echo. There's an echo. I don't know if I can fix that, but if anyone can help with an echo in the audio, thank you for helping. <laughs> in any case, um, I'll still do my best with what we, can everyone else hear okay? Okay. <laughs> um, great. So here we are, here we are. So it's uh, the cycle of four operas. It tells a story over these four parts that uh, is derived from Norse mythology. And yet Wagner had this audacious idea to tell this mythological story with the music that he described, the music of the future. It did not sound like any other opera that has existed prior. And in my opinion, it still doesn't sound like any other opera that has, that has happened up until now. He mixed sounds. He created an orchestral soundscape. He asked the singers to superhuman feats that if you compare it to any other opera of its time, just seems so radical and uh, breaks every single rule, which is, of course, why I love it so much. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, 1876 is when the first uh, production of The Ring Cycle took place. And because it was so unusual, Wagner had to build his own theater for the making of this, uh, for the, the full realization of this piece. It, the, the theater is called Bayreuth. Uh, it's in the city of Germany, the Bayreuther Festspiel uh, in Germany. And it was designed specifically for the performance of this entire ring cycle. So, I mean, in addition to that, he also created these instruments uh, because he couldn't find the right timbre for what he was trying to achieve. And so he created these things that are now called the Wagner tubas. And they're a specific sound uh, that really didn't exist in the 19th century. So I like to think of Wagner as kind of a mad scientist. You know, he really tinkered in every single aspect of what opera was about. He wrote the text entirely himself. He wrote them, obviously he wrote the music, but 
something that some people don't know about Wagner is that he never trained as a composer. He was an autodidact, so he really learned how, by just by listening, by loving Beethoven, by adoring uh, so many composers, but wanting to create something brand new, uh, he formed his own path. And I think that that is something that I think is still so inspiring about, about him. So this production, you've all premiered at the Hollywood Bowl uh, just a few weeks back uh, to fantastic reviews. And so I'm wondering, what was it like bringing this production uh, from the Hollywood Bowl, which was seats, what, 20,000 people or something? Yeah, it's a great, yeah. incredible <laughs> amount of people to uh, this, the intimacy of this house. So as Arthur said, we premiered this at the Hollywood Bowl, which is a space for amplified sound, right? But I think that if Wagner did live today, he would probably have amplified the orchestra uh, to just even make it even louder, uh, if, that's believe if that could be believed. But um, what's really wonderful about doing it here in this past week, experiencing the opera as he heard it in its acoustic vitality, which means that all of the shadings of the sound, you know, the, the, just the total dynamic range, uh, and all of the colors in the orchestra and the human voice are on full display here. And it's been such a pleasure. And of course, we have a phenomenal musical team bringing this piece to life. Of course, our associate artistic director, uh, Christine Gerke, is performing a role that really is her signature role. I mean, she is in demand for this role all over the world, and uh, you will see why. She's just an extraordinary force. Uh, next to her is the uh, Votan of Alan Held, who is also an international uh, bass bar a, a, a star, international star, bass baritone, uh, that is doing his, he's making his debut here tonight, tonight for this performance. So we're very excited about that. And leading the orchestra is uh, Sir Andrew Davis, the uh, former music director of Lyric Opera of Chicago, who has done numerous full cycles of the ring knows this material inside and out, and it has been such a great joy to work with him and to see him shape uh, this performance with this orchestra. That's incredible. We cannot wait. It will be starting shortly. We can't get there soon enough. Um, Yuval, you gave us a really great overview of the history of the ring, a little bit of history of Wagner. I wonder if you can talk to us about the short or long history of this specific production. Is this a project of many years conception, or has this kind of sprung out of our experience of the last couple of years? I would say that this kind of did spring uh, fairly quickly out of a reaction to where we are. As you'll see, <clears throat> Um, it is not an elaborate stage setup, or it might not seem like an elaborate stage setup. Um, we have, it looks blue now, but when the lighting ha uh, <laughs> goes into effect for the show, you'll see that this is a green screen that the singers will be standing in front of, and that's, that's all in terms of real, physical, material set. Uh, they're in costumes, but they have a very shallow space. They will be acting, though, simultaneously in those screens in a three-dimensional animated and digital universe that has many, many different dimensions. And so you, as an audience member, will be able to experience both of these performances simultaneously. You'll see them live and hear them acoustically here on the, on the stage. But you'll also see them get transported into another dimension, into another world. And to Andrea's question, I think this was in many ways a response to where we are now after two years. I mean, we've reopened the Opera House now uh, in April with La Boheme and with Malcolm X. This is our third, uh, under my watch, my third a piece happening in this uh, Opera House. And uh, I think we're coming back to the Opera House with a lot of questions as to what does it mean to come back to opera after two years of experiencing opera uh, digitally watching operas on our phones, watching operas, and watching all other kinds of performance and music and art uh, in a different kind of way. How has that changed our perception? What did we lose during those two years that we're so happy to come back to? I think the answer will certainly be the music, the richness of the music, and that experience of the acoustic sound and the presence of these voices and the presence of the orchestra. Uh, but we also gained this possibility of what new media might be able uh, to, uh, how new media might be able to expand storytelling and how we might be able to think about new ways of experiencing these pieces. I think the thing that always drew me to opera was the fact that it was, you know, it is the original multimedia art form. It's the first art form where all these different artists came together 
without a roadmap. You know, there was a composer, there was a poet, there was a choreographer, there were dancers, there were singers, there were sometimes horses. Everything that you could imagine got kind of thrown into something that was really unstable and uncertain. And over the years, of course, it became something more predictable and more, uh, uh, more, uh, more stable, I guess, is the right way to put it. But um, I think at the core is this kind of unruly and unstable mix of all the arts. And I think technology plays a huge part in thinking about what the future of this art form might be. Um, something that can preserve what we love about the art form and then push our ideas of storytelling, of narrative, and of music into new dimensions. So I think this particular piece and this production asks you to think about those, uh, those questions. I want to take that a little further because in this production we have this confluence not only of multimedia but also of kind of time periods. We have this music from the 1870s, we have this kind of cutting edge, very current visual digital technology, um, but the visuals that we're going to see have a very 80s or early 90s aesthetic. Um, so I, how did you think about melding all of these elements and what um, inspiration from the music do the visuals draw? That's a great question and probably worth a little bit of introduction. Um, the um, aesthetic of the ring cycle itself is in a way retrofuturist. So to explain what that phrase means, it's both retrospective, you know, Wagner is looking back at Norse mythology, these kind of ancient stories, the stories of th these gods and goddesses and the mortals and dwarves and giants and uh, a powerful ring that Wotan is after. It's really the same exact mythology that Tolkien uh, was inspired by in writing The Lord of the Rings. So he's going back to something that feels like it's primordial, but he's cloaking it in music and certainly in the first production, he was after a kind of a stagecraft that felt like it was a future, uh, it, an opera that sounded like nothing else. And so it exists in this place between the past and the future. It's part of what makes it feel timeless and part of what makes it challenging to stage because if you go entirely uh, mythological, you know, Wagner did not want that. He did not want a pure uh, reproduction of old ideas. He did want the audience to be pushed to think of new imagery and new ideas. And yet if you go completely futuristic, uh, you know, you also maybe lose out a little bit on the mythic symbolism. So I think for our production, we wanted to find a place that also felt retro-futurist. And so for me and uh, the team, uh, the creative team that worked with me, we thought, let's find a language that feels both like it's looking back uh, and also forward thinking. And for us, that was kind of a video game aesthetic, 80s and 90s video game aesthetic. Uh, for those of you that know the movie uh, Tron, that was a huge inspiration for us. Um, at the time, Tron was a really baffling film for so many people because, uh, but for so many reasons, but it kind of, um, it almost, uh, you know, gave a sense of what the internet was going to be. This, the, you know, so w looking back at this film, it is a fantastic in-between space between uh, the future and the past. So we wanted to explore that kind of aesthetic um, in telling this in telling this kind of story. When we first started working on it, we were looking at very naturalistic landscapes, thinking that you know. Uh, there's the description of mountaintops, so we were looking at Mount Everest and thinking maybe it would be kind of photorealistic, but that just didn't feel right with this fantasy world that Wagner was creating. So we wanted to uh, delve into a fantasy and also to really take advantage of this two-dimensionality of the screens uh, and invite you into that kind of, that kind of world. I was going to say, when you talked about uh, one of your inspirations, I heard in an interview, you talked about the movie Back to the Future. Are we going to have a DeLorean or a flux capacitor or anything like that? Uh, no, nothing like that, no. but, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, th they don't ride horses in this. When the Valkyries uh, ride through the air, they won't be riding horses, so, uh, um, okay. so sorry if, I, if my mention of horses might have led you a little bit astray. But um, <laughs> I won't give away exactly what they ride, but I will say that it's part of why we wanted to do this production this way you know, the beginning of this, ent this entire act is uh, eight warrior women, these Valkyries, uh, they're supposed to ride through the air taking fallen heroes to Wotan's, uh, vote the, the, the home of the gods, Valhalla, mm -hmm. right? So 
it's very difficult to stage this scene, partially because this incredibly famous music sets this high of an expectation of what you're going to see. And it's almost impossible to realize it within the three walls of a theater. And that's kind of what got us thinking about this digital application to tell this story, because actually in our situation, they don't physically fly, the singers, but you'll see them in the screen fly through the air. And I think that's part of what we were after with this, is trying to actually realize what Wagner really wanted to, be, uh, to see on stage, but to, find, to use the latest technology to see how we can realize that. Had you rehearsed a production, or tell us about rehearsing a production where you had to work in both 2D and 3D at the same time? Yeah, I mean, uh, try to, hopefully you won't be thinking about this very much while you're, while, <laughs> while you're enjoying the performance, but maybe afterwards as you're uh, leaving the theater tonight and you're piecing together what you saw, give a little bit uh, extra credit to these singers who really, their staging involves move to number four and B, and you have to be exactly on your spot because that's how you're going to be in this digital image. And then on this musical cue, you have to run all the way across the stage and make it over there to 20 so that this camera can catch you. Um, it's an elaborately choreographed um, uh, scenography for these singers who are used to being in a three-dimensional space and interacting with each other and interacting with real things, interacting with a horse, interacting with uh, all kinds of uh, props, right? They don't have that in this production, and yet they also have access to a fantasy world that is in this uh, visual, uh, in, in this video that I think also really inspired them uh, in, in exciting ways. So hopefully while you're watching it, you're just along for the ride and sucked into this world, but afterwards go, wow, those singers, how, that is amazing that they were able to do that. Absolutely. You know, you talk about sort of being sucked into this world, and I do want to ask you a little bit about balancing the those technical demands that you speak about with just the, the truth of this story, which is the story of a father and daughter and two sisters. How did you find that balance? Yeah. Um, in the end, I think what will ultimately really move you all is not the technology. I love this technology, it's very exciting. But uh, at the core of this act is such an unforgettable depiction of a father and daughter, which is why everyone loves this act of uh, Die Valkyrie. Uh, it's the scene where Wotan um, say, says goodbye to his favorite daughter. He has to punish her in this very, it's a very complicated uh, situation, but she was fulfilling his wishes, uh, but also against his laws. It's a little bit like, Wagner was really inspired by um, Antigone, uh, the, 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 famous, uh, the, the, the famous antique play of Antigone, where Antigone faces uh, her father Creon uh, burying, uh, burying her brother. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I don't think, it's his, don't think it's her father. I think it's her, like, Brother, right? Okay, right. So she's facing her brother, but she's buried. She's buried someone against the law, and then there's this this fight between two people who are both right, and that's what made that Greek that that's what made that tragedy so heartbreaking and such an incredible moral dilemma, uh, and is fa why it's still performed today because there's no easy answers. We have that same exact setup here in uh, Die Valkyrie, where Wotan has these very rigid laws but is always trying to escape his own laws. And his favorite daughter was plugged into what he really wanted. And because of that, she needs to be punished. And Wotan finds himself incredibly conflicted during this entire act. And Brunhilde um, so bravely doesn't just take her fate, but keeps needling her father. I mean, she's really, you know, she's an amazing, she's an amazing character and an amazing woman who just does not follow, uh, it does not follow the rules just like her dad and keeps finding a way to make the situation as, as good as possible <laughs> under these circumstances. So uh, it's an incredibly heartfelt, beautiful farewell scene between Wotan and, and Brunhilde. And I think that one of the dimensions that comes out in this production is that Wotan's world, which is, you know, he's this all-powerful god. He's this, uh, he is the chief patriarch of the gods. And yet his world is totally flat and empty. Uh, this green screen world has nothing in it, has no dimensionality. And now the one last thing that he had, which is his love for his daughter, he has to give that up too. It's really tragic, and yet the music 
just soars in a way that absolutely, uh, absolutely gives you so much hope and so much uh, brightness. Moving into part three, <laughs> the idea is that you know I kind of joked earlier that you know uh, it was almost like you know there was there's going to be a sequel to Die Valkyrie. That sequel is part three, which is Siegfried, which we're not doing tonight. But um, but there, there's a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of this entire evening, where uh, Wotan. Uh, and his very last line, he says, "Whoever fears the, uh, the the whoever fears my spear shall never cross this fire and wake Brunhilde." Pay attention to the music in that moment because right as he's singing that, he's singing a theme, and the orchestra will repeat it. So he sings that line, and then listen for the horns because the horns are going to repeat exactly what he what he says. And in a way, it's almost like Wagner saying to be continued, because that theme will represent the hero of the next opera, which is Siegfried. So if you get really excited about tonight and you want to go hear the ring cycle uh, when you get home or tomorrow, and you listen to Siegfried, you will hear that theme over and over and over again. And that, in many ways, is, is a microcosm for how this entire 16-hour opera is built. It's built entirely of these tiny little themes. The philosopher Nietzsche called Wagner a great miniaturist which I think is so funny because we always think of Wagner as the great maximalist, like the person who had so many instruments in his orchestra and huge vocal lines. But his entire huge web of music is built up of these tiny, tiny little cells. I'll give you one other example of this. The last line for Sieglinde, right before she leaves, she sings a line that in German it goes, O herrstes Wunder, O herrlichste Maid. And it, it is for a theme that for anyone who saw Twilight Gods in the parking garage, maybe it'll be familiar because it's how the entire ring cycle ends with the theme that is depicted in this particular act. Um, it's one of the things that makes the ring and uh, any one act of the ring endlessly fascinating because you can keep going back uh, and listening to it again and again and discovering new connections through those musical uh, motifs. I had the great pleasure uh, back in July, we, you spoke earlier about Bayreuth. This is, the, of course, the house that uh, Wagner built for The Ring and other his other operas as well. But it premiered in 1876 with, with The Ring Cycle. I had the great pleasure of uh, attending a performance where you had uh, the, uh, directed a, a performance of Lohengrin. And, uh, and then the next day, uh, actually the, that same day, you took us uh, on a tour of Wagner's house, which was completely fascinating. And I was so struck uh, by the fact that, you know, uh, while we were there, there was this understanding that under to, to talk about Wagner, you still had to talk about his politics, uh, specifically his uh, uh, anti-Semitism. And I wonder, as the only the second uh, uh, person of Jewish descent to actually, you know, direct at Bayreuth, can you tell us about your journey with that history and with Wagner? Yeah. I think that's probably what a lot of people associate with Wagner still is, um, I, I actually think a lot of people mistakenly believe that um, Wagner was a member of the Nazi party. <laughs> and uh, I only laugh because you have to always tell people when they think that, you know, Wagner died in, in 1883, you know, so it's, there's, a, there's a quite a long period of time between when he died and when this, um, this uh, horrific fascist party uh, emerged in, in Israel that, that affected my own family uh, directly. Um, so it's always kind of an interesting, uh, complicated story when I grapple with these works of Wagner's because, um, of course, I think they are the most thrilling uh, pieces of music in the operatic literature. Um, it's, it's why I wanted to start my tenure here in Detroit with a version of Goethe with Twilight Gods, and now bringing um, Valkyries here for all you, for, for everyone here tonight. Um, but the complication to me is he was a notorious anti-Semite, and there's no excusing it. Some people like to relativize it by saying, oh, you know, in its time, everyone was anti-Semitic back then. Not a great excuse, if you ask me. Um, but uh, despite that, it's, he was a human, like we're all humans. He was not a he was not a god. And actually, the gods that he depicts are also pretty uh, questionable people with questionable morals. Vote, don't think of Votan the way we think of kind of a god almighty that we think is uh, pure and perfect. They're fallible. And if gods are fallible, 
how much more so are humans with all of their challenges and problems. Again, it's not, to, it's not to relativize it or to apologize for it. It's just to realize that the music itself and the operas themselves have such a fascinating view of the complexity of what it means to be human that it makes it endlessly, to me, vitally important that we keep visiting this material and keep looking for what is most noble in it, what is so great in it, without pretending that the shadow side is not also part of it. The shadow is what gives it the complexity. And that shadow of a person who clearly had so many negative and awful traits could nevertheless write such bold, unbelievable music. You know, it's, uh, it's endlessly fascinating. And uh, for those of you that are starting to experience Wagner uh, through these productions that we're doing, I hope that that fascination, um, rather than repelling you, I hope it only uh, invites you in to, to learn more and to question more about what is it that makes these pieces still so important for us to be doing? And how is there a way, I will say from the point of view of a director, you know, how, how can we in the depiction of these pieces not change the narrative, but place the accent on something that is uh, uh, something we can feel like we can, we can uh, get behind, <laughs> that we can put our name on. So when I was working in Bayreuth, Lohengrin is an opera that, you know, in my opinion, you know, Meistersinger, some of his other operas, uh, musicologists have questioned whether there is uh, kind of anti-Semitic content in it. I personally don't agree, but there isn't enough time tonight to talk about it. Lohengrin does not have those same complicated uh, issues. And nevertheless, I wanted to create a production there that would feel like it was being true to the progressive and humanist ideas that are really in this piece and are why this piece is, pieces like these are important to do today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think you, you answered the question I was going to ask about um, why we continue to retell these stories. You know, we've seen a real resurgence, I'd say, in the last 20 years of media dedicated um, to this North mythology, not only through Lord of the Rings. If anyone is a Rick Riordan fan, the Magnus Chase book series, we see um, uh, Valkyrie the, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now. So there's so many ways, Thor. Um, so there's so many ways that we can re-experience these stories. And we're just all so delighted that you've come uh, to be here with us tonight as we see it yet again in this medium. Um, you all, thank you so much for that beautiful encapsulation and for all of your work. Excellent. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being Glad here. Glad you could join us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Enjoy the performance. <laughs>